Edinburgh Senators before that. Okay. This is Julian Bond, the 27-year-old legislator from the state of Georgia, who was denied his seat by his colleagues, and finally, after about two years of battling, only this January, managed to, through the U.S. Supreme Court, gain his seat in the Georgia legislature. Le legislature. I'm Dwayne Trecker, and with me is Dr. Manfred Brennan, chairman of the Political Science Department at Western Washington State College. Uh, we are very happy to have you with us here, Mr. Bond. I know that you are the spokesman of many, for many causes and concerns. Uh, your interests are manifold in that they touch foreign affairs as well as domestic affairs. And since you are very clearly identified with uh, certain ideas as far as Vietnam is concerned, with your kind permission, let us start first on this. And perhaps very briefly might you suggest how you feel about the matter of Vietnam. Well, my position is that the things that the United States does overseas are related to its behavior towards people inside the country and that there's a relationship between what I consider our aggressive behavior in Vietnam and the treatment of minority groups inside the United States. That taken separately, both are wrong, and take, taken together, they're even wronger. Uh, I imagine that, uh, or rather, I'm of the opinion that our involvement in Vietnam is wrong, it's illegal, it's immoral, it's unchristian, it's un-Buddhist, it's un-Jewish, it's un-Catholic. Uh, we ought not be there, we ought to disengage ourselves, and that there will never be decent treatment for minority peoples in this country until we begin to concentrate on freedom and justice and equality for those at home and stop worrying about uh, puppet dictatorships and despotic governments in Southeast Asia. In other words, you make it a special point of identifying yourself as a Negro with the stand against Vietnam. Right, right. I think you can be white and be against the That's war right, Vietnam, but I mean, but you uh, make it a special point right. as a Negro. Uh, similar observations, of course, have been made by others, and I think uh, one of the last ones would have been the Reverend Martin Luther King, right. who has come out in same location. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you would also probably say that there are so many Negroes would not change you. No, certainly there are. There are a great many who, who don't hold my position and who don't hold Dr. King's position. Uh, part of what I try to do is convince them that they're wrong and I'm right. Yes. No, uh, 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 as you can see, in the United States, there are certain people for, I would think probably that the majority of the people of the United States are in support of the United States government and a minority probably opposed to it. Would you say that that sort of observation also would hold true for the American Negroes. Well, I'm not so sure if that's correct. I think there are a majority of people in this country who just have no feelings toward it one way or the other. They're apathetic toward their government. They're apathetic toward what their government does domestically as well as in foreign affairs. They feel no relationship to what their government does. They feel they have no control over it. And that a small minority of people in this country favor a vigorous prosecution of the war, and a small majority favors a withdrawal, a de-escalation, a phasing out of the war. And in between these two groups, there's a large body of Americans who are completely apolitical. They have no feelings about the war one way or the other, unless they've been touched by it personally, unless they have a, a son fighting there, unless they have a, a father or husband, unless it touches them in some personal way, they have no feelings toward it one way or the other. Are you, are you saying that you don't advocate a, just an immediate unilateral pull-out, but a, you said, phasing down the war? No, I'm saying that they're, among the anti-war people, there are different positions about the way to end the war. Mine is to get out, to leave. We should have left yesterday, and liking that, we should leave tomorrow. But, but how would you answer to the people you leave behind? Leave behind? Well, if, uh, which people? The Marshal the, Key? Uh, I don't think he's, he's due an answer. Uh, I mean, the man has, is a puppet, is a dictator. If he's worried, if he's in fear of his life, uh, I think we could take him with us. Uh, perhaps we could set him up in some other country all his own. But uh, I don't feel we have the responsibility to him that we have to the hundreds and thousands of ordinary citizens in Vietnam who are victims of both sides in this war, who are being killed and murdered on every occasion by both sides in this war. I think our responsibility is to them and not to the martial key. Now, when you say that we should put out, pull out first to begin with, uh, you call uh, Key a puppet, an American puppet, mm. you say that. When you talk about pulling out, 
Well, and since you just mentioned that there are so many people, victims on both sides, would you then suggest the same to happen, that the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong also pull out? Well, they can't pull out of their own country. See, we're in two different situations. We are the outsiders. The Americans are the invaders. We are the ones who have come from another part of the globe into their part of the globe. You can't, by any stretch of the imagination, make a correlation between our position there and the position of the forces of the National Liberation Front, who are largely Southerners, or the position of the regular army forces of North Vietnam, who are, after all, Vietnamese people. They speak, they have a common language. They well, they've crossed the, the national border, though, haven't they? What sort of national border? It was drawn at Michigan State University. I mean, it's no national border. That's one country. No, and we have similar situation, however, in North and South Korea. Exactly so. And East and West Germany. Right. Uh, how about that? Well, there's, a, again, a difference between uh, a Chinese soldier coming from China into North Korea and an American soldier coming from the United States of America, uh, rather than a, than a South Korean coming from South Korea into North Korea. There, I see a tremendous difference in that. In other words, I see would... one as, an, as, a, as a citizen of one part of, the, of this, this divided country saying, uh, I want unification or I want a togetherness, I don't like a political situation in the other part, I want to change it. And the other situation is an outsider, and an invader, an aggressor coming in and saying, I don't like what goes on here and I want to change it. I don't think the two situations are exactly alike. The Chinese invaded North Korea. The United States has invaded Vietnam. And what about the Russians in, in, in East Germany? Right, that the Russians did in uh, Hungary exactly the same thing that we're doing in Vietnam. They're trying to put down they put down a legitimate revolt on, the heart of, on behalf of the people of Hungary, and we are trying to put down a legitimate revolt on the part of the people of Vietnam. Uh, and so, did the Russians do that at the request of, of the constituted government? Uh, well, such as it was. And uh, I imagine you could say that we are doing it at the result, at the request, at the request. of one of the constituted governments. I, I say, I'm saying the Russians were wrong, uh, just as we are wrong in this instance. But uh, the, the Russians having done it is no excuse for us doing it. But you see, come, coming back to the example, you would then tolerate if the North Vietnamese would today invade South, uh, the, the North Koreans would invade South Korea? Today? No, I don't, I don't tolerate invasions uh, by, or, or violent uprisings by any group of people against any other group of people for any means. But I'm more tolerable, uh, if, you, if you cannot tolerate and be more tolerable, I'd be much more tolerable of a citizen of one part of a divided country going to another part than I would be of a person who's completely an outsider. The Chinese in that equation were completely uh, without right, uh, without uh, correctness to enter themselves into that situation, just as the Americans find themselves in the Chinese position in Vietnam. I do not know whether you have just read last night and this morning's paper, but there is a report that 16 senators to it uh, Senator Fulbright, uh, Senator Morse, and Senator McGovern, and whoever they may be, may be described as the dogs in the war, um, have come out with a statement to Ho Chi Minh, uh, suggesting that he better reconsider the whole matter and give in to the concept of a negotiated peace. Otherwise, America will not move out, and that they will back this sort of concept. How do you feel I about this development? Well, I think their phrase was that uh, the United States would not leave until there's an honorable peace. Uh, every end of a war is a negotiated settlement. If, I, if you and I fight and I defeat you, we negotiate the terms of the, of the cessation of hostilities. If we fight to a stalemate, we still negotiate the settlement of hostilities. Yes. Uh, if the United States withdraws, I imagine there's got to be some negotiation of how it's going to take place, at what rate, under what conditions, and so forth. I'm, my position is a little uh, advanced of those of uh, men in the Senate and the House of Representatives, but I'm saying that the United States ought to leave. But I think it's really ridiculous to ask Ho Chi Minh to negotiate with the United States of America. I mean, it's as though I came into your home and beat you up, and uh, then asked you to negotiate with me. You don't, shouldn't negotiate with me, you should throw me out. Of course, when you say home, then I see, and, uh, if, if I accept your idea, that uh, Vietnam is a house, then at best, uh, Ho Chi Minh lives in one apartment and I'm entering another apartment. And so all I would suggest, I'm here because somebody has asked me, why don't you stay in your apartment also? I don't know whether that well, makes sense to you. It, uh, it makes 
a little bit of sense, but not a great deal. And the reason that it doesn't is because, I, first, I don't hold that there are two apartments. I hold that there's one big living room and that we're all in it, that are both Ho Chi Minh and Marshall Key in it. In fact, Marshall Key is from uh, Hanoi, and probably he ought to go back up there. Uh, he's probably afraid for his life if he did. Uh, but I, what I hold is that it's one country, that a group of people who lived in the South, who were indigenous to the South, who were Southerners, began a revolt against what they considered to be an undemocratic and despotic government in the South. They began to receive aid from people in the North, and that aid is still fairly minute in comparison to the amounts of aid that come from the other side, and that it still retains a great many of the characteristics of, the, of a civil war. It's exactly uh, the same characteristics of our Revolutionary War, when the French uh, gave us a great deal of help, uh, without whose help we would not have won, uh, like our Civil War, when the northern part of this country invaded the southern part. Uh, it's a dispute between two forces within one uh, geophysical area and ought to be settled, I think, by them without interference from those on the outside. Now, um, uh, war, of course, has been with mankind. Uh, all of us hope that in due time mankind can live without um, war. And so I have been wondering, because Obviously, you're not the only one in this country to have a stand that you just have developed. I've been wondering as to the selectivity with which some people speak about war. There seem to be a heavy concern with some of the injustices done by the United States. People, in the case of Vietnam, we don't talk so much about Korea, even in retrospect. But we do not talk actually about other wars. For instance, today, when, when you feel indignant about the American presence in the case of South Vietnam, do you feel indignant, for instance, as to the presence of the United Arab Republic or Saudi Arabia in a country of a third nature named Yemen? Does that bother you? No, oh, certainly it does, but let me make this one point. I live in the United States of America, and I feel when my country does something, if it does something I approve of or disagree with, no, nevertheless does it in my name because I'm one of the citizens of this country. And I feel a greater responsibility towards setting my country straight than I do toward setting the North Vietnamese straight. Now, no one can deny that the North Vietnamese engage in acts of terror. I mean, that's a matter of public record. But is it my place to say uh, uh, it's okay for the U.S. to do the same sort of thing just because they do it? No, I think my place is to say they commit acts of terror. I realize it. I don't like it. It's wrong. But my country does things that are wrong, and it's my country, it's my job to set my country straight. Yeah. Now, uh, of course there are, again, as I suggested before, a number of people talking against the injustice of their country. You, as a spokesman of your group, uh, feel quite emphatic that because of the involvement of this country in Vietnam, the problems of the Negro cannot be solved. In other words, the solution of that problem will depend on the moving out of the United States forces and government from Vietnam. Do you sincerely feel that as far as the United States is concerned, I'm talking now about the federal government, I'm talking about the government or the country at large, I'm not talking about your home state, Georgia or Alabama in the deep south, that uh, would you say that progress has been made or not? Certainly progress has been made, but I look at the figures of expenditures for, how many people are there in South Vietnam? 13 million? Uh, there are 15 million Negroes in this country. Uh, certainly not all of them live in poverty. Some of them live quite well, but there are certainly more than 15 million poor people in this country. Now, we spend 27 billion or more dollars a year in Vietnam for 13 million Vietnamese people with whose condition I sympathize but we spend less than one twelfth of that to alleviate the conditions of the more than 15 million poor people in the United States of America. We have dispatched to Vietnam 350,000 or more federal troops, uh, army, members of the armed forces, the Navy, the Air Force, and the Marines, and hesitate to send one or two federal registrars into my state or another part of the Deep South to encourage American citizens uh, not to be afraid if they want to register to vote. I think that's hypocrisy. I think it's hypocrisy of the worst kind. I think my government is treating me unfairly, that it's expressing a concern for people who are millions of miles, thousands of miles away from it, 
people who have not done any harm to my country and is not attacking my enemies who are very much right here at home. Now, uh, uh, perhaps this sounds too uh, rough a question. Uh, wouldn't you say, for instance, the very fact that we sit here or that you have been elected by the citizens of the state of Georgia, that the Supreme Court of the United States rightly, I emphasize, got you into the possession of your rights and powers, namely to be a rightful representative in the state legislature of your state. Wouldn't you say that sort of this would be indicative of a rather generous attitude of this country? No, I don't think it was generous. I think it was correct. Uh, listen, if I, if you do something that's correct to me, if you do something that's decent and honest and right to me, I don't think you do it because uh, you're being generous. I think you're doing it because you know that it's right. And you're not being generous to me, you're being decent. You're being honest, you're being correct, and you're being fair. And that's what I want my country to be, not generous. Uh, I won my case in the Supreme Court because my position was the correct one, not because the Supreme Court was generous to me. Certainly things are better for, this, for Negroes in this country today than they were a few years ago. But the fact remains that Negroes have been in the United States for 400 years. And we're still not treated as are other people who come to this country from European countries who step off the boat, and as they step off the boat, they're given a job. It's very irritating to me that uh, a large population not just for Vietnam, but for the military generally, for a couple of reasons. First, because it's just obviously unfair. It sounds laughable, but it's unfair to, to men because it discriminates uh, against men in favor of women. I don't see any reason why uh, women should not be drafted into the United States Army, the Marines, the Air Force, and the other military agencies in this country. They're certainly capable. Some of them are much larger than I am, and certainly much stronger, and probably a great deal more warlike. Uh, additionally, it obviously discriminates against the poor educated members of our society, against Negroes and other members of minority groups, against poor young white men who don't have the educational qualifications to escape uh, the draft. Uh, secondly, because of the nature of the needs of the armed forces, it always will discriminate. There are more young men in this country who are eligible than there are needed. So that in a typical town, John Jones will have to go, and his neighbor, Bobby Smith, who lives across the street, will not. That's unfair. It's unfair to place that burden on John Jones and not to place it on Bobby Smith. I'd like to see the draft eliminated completely and replaced with a volunteer army, a highly paid army, an army that would be attractive to a young man as a career, uh, an army that I think, and I, I think the Pentagon thinks so also, could function if not as well, if not better, than the present one that we have now. But uh, if there would be an end to discrimination in the draft, for instance, uh, a college student would be as draftable as anyone else. Would that make more sense to you? It'd make a little more sense, but it wouldn't make completely good sense. You see, there's still the discrimination that comes when uh, a small number is needed and a large number is available. Yes. Uh, that's, that's just wrong and can only be eliminated by either drafting everybody, which certainly is no answer, or by stop drafting anybody. Of course, you imply one way or the other that uh, there seemed to be a need for armed forces for the time being. Well, no, I don't think so, uh, but I think the country thinks so. It's not about to get rid of the army, so given the fact that you have to have the army, it ought to be the best and most yeah. decent and fairest army. Yeah. I was wondering, since we had talked about several domestic matters, whether we could talk about what perhaps some people might consider a new phenomenon, namely the development of black power. I wonder whether you would mind to make some observation on this. No, it seems to me it's a legitimate desire on the part of Negroes in this country to achieve political, economic, and social power. Other groups in this country have had it. Uh, the Irish Americans in Massachusetts, for one instance, Italian Americans in New York might be said to have Italian power. Uh, Polish people, descendants of Polish people and other Eastern European people who live in Chicago have an effect uh, in Eastern European power. They elect a public office. People whose last names are like theirs in 
uh, the southwestern part of this country, Spanish and Mexican Americans are beginning to have uh, Spanish American power. They've elected a couple of Spanish American congressmen and other Spanish and Mexican Americans to public office. And what black power seeks for Negroes is exactly the same thing that these other ethnic and minority groups have had for themselves. But, yeah, of course, you have had, when you mention as an example, the uh, legislative personnel. Uh, on the federal level, obviously, you have had men like um, Powell for a long, long time, or mm. representative from the major metropolitan areas of Chicago or Detroit or... Uh, right, New incidentally, York. that shows one rule, that white people, by and large, will not vote for a Negro. Senator Brooke is the only one of those Negroes in office on the national level who was elected by a white constituency. All of the others had to exercise what I call black power in order to get into public office. Powell could not have been elected in any other part of New York City. Congressman Dawson could not have been elected in any other part of New York, of uh, Chicago. John Conyers could not have been elected in any other part of but Detroit. But still, I mean, since they have been elected, as you suggested, mainly by Negro personnel, wouldn't that be indi indicative that they are the expression of something like black power? They are. I think in some cases they're a bad expression of it. Uh, Dawson uh, certainly is no shining example of how uh, a public figure ought to represent his constituency who are largely poor, uh, welfare recipients. I don't think he's a very good representative of uh, their desires. They apparently think so because they keep re-electing him, uh, partly because of the vicious control he exercises over them through his participation in the daily machine. But they are examples. They happen to be, some of them happen to be bad examples yeah. of black power. Of course, there has been some kind of thinking, perhaps wrong kind of thinking, in the United States as to the extent of black power. Uh, black power not just being an expression as you defined it, but something that might be willing to take over somewhat more than you seemingly suggest. Well, if, if that did happen, first it would simply be a reversal of roles in this country. Negroes would begin to be doing what white people have done all along. I think the reason people fear the term is that they, white people particularly, think that Negroes will do to them what white people have been doing to us for so many years. But as I see the term, it's neither negative or positive. It's neither violent or nonviolent. But in its use may be any of those things. I'm hopeful that it will be a positive or a good, a progressive war. But it could be a very bad one, just as white power, if such exists in this country, can be a, a benefit to all people, or it can be brutal and oppressive and discriminatory and filled with bigotry. Now, would it then be perhaps necessary to redefine for the convenience of many what really the term black power stands for. Uh, I mean, well, I think it by persons like you, well, using think, some of the uh, Those channels. who originate the, the term, uh, Stoker Carmichael, for instance, has time and time again defined it, only to be told by others uh, that's not true. I think if you were to make up a slogan, you call it, say, grass power, and say grass power means the ability of grass to grow, it's not my position to come and tell you that you're correct because it's your slogan and you've made it up. Carmichael says that black power means what I've just said that it means. And I believe him. I take him at his word. He's done it a great many times and he's always being told that's not true. That's not what it really means. It really means this. But it doesn't help Mr. Carmichael's cause, though, to, does it, when you get groups like Black Panther groups? Uh, well, it uh, depends on what these groups do. There are a great many Black Panther groups in this country. Most of them are just political organizations. Uh, they want some kind of political expression for Negroes. Uh, and I think that's a legitimate request, a legitimate desire. Now, uh, let me say, do you expect then, as a result of this, uh, changes in the South that I personally feel are still quite necessary, even if integration of one kind or the other has taken place uh, on the education level, particularly? of the higher education. Oh that? yeah, there's got to be a change in the social order. I mean, it wouldn't do any good if every Negro in Georgia could go to the University of Georgia because not all want to go, uh, not all need to go. Uh, everyone doesn't need a college education. What people need is a decent life. They need a home and a job and something to eat. And they don't get that simply by being allowed to go to the University of Georgia or being able to sit down at the lunch counter and order a hamburger. They need some economic changes in their lives. That's what society's got to produce. They should all be allowed to go. Right. This isn't what you're saying. Yes. Some right. They should be allowed to go, but no need for everybody to go. I mean, there's no what need for think? everybody in Washington to go to this school, either. What about uh, uh, J. Edgar Hoover and the uh, recent pronouncements by the uh, House Subcommittee on Appropriations about apparent affiliations? 
the what Mr. Mr. Carmichael. Hoover was talking about was uh, a series of meetings that are supposed to have taken place between Carmichael and a fellow named Max Stanford. I don't know if Carmichael and Max Stanford have ever met together, but I have met with Max Stanford. Don't feel myself a dupe or a tool or being in the hands of the international communist conspiracy of the Chinese variety. I think Mr. Hoover is waving the familiar bugaboo before Americans that says that communists are bad, that if someone meets with or associates with a communist, then he's bad, and you should therefore never listen to any more pronouncements he makes. The other thing about J. Edgar Hoover, uh, the, some of the things he's said ought to reassure Americans that things are actually all right with the world. For instance, he says the civil rights movement has been infiltrated by the Communist Party. He additionally says that the FBI has infiltrated the Communist Party. So what's really happened, I assume from that, is that the FBI has infiltrated the civil rights movement. So perhaps what he means is that Stokely Carmichael has been having meetings with an FBI agent. Uh, now, uh, to come perhaps back again once more to matters of accomplishing the perfect development as far as the Negro group in this country is concerned. Are you, for instance, opposed also to the concept, as I saw in an article this in, in the U.S. News and World Report, are you opposed to this term integration? Do you feel that integration itself is something well, I'm wrong? A, I'm opposed to it as it's defined in this country. For instance, if you have an all-white school and, and uh, a Negro goes to it, one Negro child goes to it, that school becomes an integrated school. I'm opposed to that. A school is not integrated, it has one Negro student. What I'm in favor of is not integration or segregation, but Negroes and Mexican-Americans and other minority groups and other poor people in this country having a decent life. And that involves, to me, neither integration or segregation. It involves certain economic changes in this country. It involves a, a, a slight distribution of the wealth of this country. It involves a chance for all Americans to have a decent and productive life. No, I'm quite sure that, of course, uh, this is the majority opinion of the people of the United States uh, who I, I think have come out very clearly in behalf of integration and do not consider integration as a matter of uh, having a few people go to school. They, they, I think it is a little bit more. It has to do with matters of housing. It has to do with, trans, with economics, what have you. Well, uh, that may be so. I'm sure that there are Americans who define it that way.